Hello, everyone. It's me, Andrew. I'm here in my home in lovely Ligonier, Pennsylvania. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood, and hopefully you all have been well and that um, you're having a great start to your week. It's been kind of busy. Um, all last week, I took off, mostly took off, to attend uh, a workshop at the Center for Metal Arts in Johnstown, Pennsylvania. I was able to work with Steven Yusko. And yeah, so I've been playing catch up since I was off mostly. So yeah, it's been super busy. I'm getting ready to be a presenter, an early artist or early career um, artist for the symposium at uh, Touchstone. It's the snag at Touchstone event, and I'm super excited about that. Uh, but I'm getting everything ready, and I'd like to do some things with the things that I did during the workshop uh, because I think it makes sense. If you're watching, say hello, and maybe where you're tuning in from. It's always nice to hear where folks are watching. Um, I see Teresa's watching. Hey, Teresa. Yeah, so we've been super busy here. And then just house stuff, getting things ready here. Um, so it's just been a lot of the things going on. Um, so yeah, busy, busy, busy. Oh, June's watching. Hi, June. Yeah, so we're not doing... Uh, normally, I try to do a tutorial on Tuesdays. But this Tuesday, I am a little bit out of sorts. I have so much stuff that I have to do to get ready and to catch up on. And I'm a bit backlogged, so you'll have to forgive me for not doing a tutorial this week. Um, hopefully, we'll do one next week, or I'll pop one in sometime throughout the week. Um, yeah. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to flip the camera around, and I'm going to show you some paintings I've been working on. Um, if you did not see, I did a whole series maybe two weeks ago or so, um, and they showed kind of the process of using the gel press and using paints and different things and my collage techniques. Um, and if you want, you can go to our YouTube channel or our live uh, video list and you can see some of those things. Um, Teresa says she's watching from Long Island. Uh, Vivian says, hello from sunny Blackfoot, Idaho. It's super sunny here today, too. Cheryl's watching, says, um, hi, Andrew. Hope you're able to enjoy some of that sunshine tonight. A little bit. We went out for the in the yard for a little bit, um, but mostly I've been trying to work and catch up, so, and then get ready for things for the future. So it's a little bit it's a little bit frantic, y'all, a little bit frantic, um, but mostly good, so so there's that. All right, so I'm going to flip this around, and um, we'll just hop right into it. Now, if you did not see, um, if you go to my personal, actually my kind of artist business, uh, um, my artist uh, Instagram feed, you can see uh, I did day by day kind of uh, summaries and synopsis of what we did. Um, and so you can kind of follow along. And some of the stories are all gone because those only last for 24 hours. But um, I try to document things while I'm taking classes. I don't know about you, but if I don't do that it's like goes in this ear and then goes out that ear and then becomes smoke um and so i'm kind of i don't know about you um like william's definitely opposite in this regard but i am definitely a kind of a slow learner and i know that sounds bad that sounds like um like something's not right or something, but, um, or that I'm being like harsh on myself, but I'm somebody who, um, I rarely pick things up easily the first time. Um, it's one of those things where it takes me a lot of time to kind of get those things into 
my vocabulary and build the muscle memory and to understand things on a on a kind of fundamental level. And then once I do that, I can recall that and I can, you know, I use that and can pick it up. Um, William, he, when he does, when he takes classes and stuff, he picks stuff right away and he's like, busts out this little thing and it's like perfect. And I'm like, well, that's nice. And here I am, like we took a pottery class together and, um, and his little pots were so cute. And then mine were all like misshapen and gnarled up. Um, but then once I got it, I got it. But, um, and I'm also somebody who will continue to do something um, after the class. So that's one thing where, um, like, I try to, you know, synthesize it into my own kind of work, so to speak. Um, but it takes a while for me. I'm not somebody who generally picks things up pretty quick. So for me, it's a little bit, it takes... It, uh, it takes time and I have to write things down and I take notes and I take videos and I take photographs and I document the process because then it becomes a part of my memory and my ability to use it. Otherwise, I, I might as well not do it, really, to be honest. Um, Bonnie says, we all learn differently. Hi, Andrew. Good to know yourself. I agree. It's super good because if you don't realize the way that you learn um, and how you process information, then you're always going to, I think you're always going to be frustrated. Like there was a day um, in the week when nothing was going right. Like everything was going wrong. I couldn't get my fire started. There was snow on the mountain and it was a few minutes late to class and it just kind of, everything kind of snowballed and, and nothing was kind of working, you know? Sometimes it's things just like click into place and it's easy going, um, but then sometimes you, the, you just have a bad day for whatever reason and it's hard to, um, when you have such a short class, it's hard. I, that's another thing. It's like a source of anxiety when you know you have such a short class and if you have one bad day, that's, you know, one, um, one fifth of the class. And really it's one fourth of the class because the Fridays are usually like cleanup days and stuff. So anyways, um, let me see. Um, Vivian says, beautiful pictures of cats and flowers on your Instagram. So I have two Instagrams. I have my personal Instagram, which is Andrew T. Thornton 100, and that's cats and flowers. And then my artist page is Andrew Thornton Artist. And um, you'll see me looking for long, forlorn artistically um, and uh, as my little profile picture. But that's mostly where I post is my artist page. Um, I used to have everything kind of mixed and match. And I would post my personal stuff alongside the stuff I was doing and making. And um, um, one of my business mentors were talking and she was like, I don't know what, what this feed is about. Uh, and she was like, you know... If you want to reach a certain audience, you're going to, you're going to have to edit the way that you um, post things. So um, earlier this year, I did that. I made that split, and I was kind of worried because once you, once you make that change, all of the links that were attached to the old name be die, um, and so luckily I was able to take that old name and repurpose it as my personal one but all those old links kind of just like stopped so it was a little bit scary at first but I found that after I did that um, I got way more engagement and um, I got about 500 more followers which I mean numbers don't really matter to me too much but it is good when um, 
you know, when you're trying to do stuff and you're trying to um, show the world that your artwork is, you know, of merit, I guess. I don't know. It's a weird thing nowadays where sometimes people will look at how many followers you have and they factor that into, like, if you're going to represent a grant, for example, and reach the most people to announce that. So that's kind of where where it helps to have more followers. Um, but yeah. Um, Vivian says, I've noticed and surprised lately that because I am so used to designing jewelry, picking up the jelly plate is challenging. Yeah, I mean, there are some things that um, have a crossover. Um, so sometimes like there are things like proportions and color theory and those things all play into it um, and have similarities. Even when I'm doing stuff with the iron and the steel, um, I can see how there's still nuggets. Whether or not I can manipulate the, the raw material to do the things that I want to do to it, that's the iffy part. But um, don't discredit yourself. And also, challenges are sometimes good. Sometimes challenges show you that, um, you know, it, show, it reinforces that you're stepping outside of your comfort zone and you're growing. Um, it's hard sometimes to, to benchmark your progress, but if you know that you're in a state of being challenged, then you know you're also in a state where you're pushing yourself. And that's, I think that's a good thing. I think that's good. So keep it up. Hey, Kay, it's been a while. I haven't seen you in a long time on here, so it's good to see you. Um, Bonnie says, authenticity is such a great quality. Thanks. Um, Harry says, hello, Andrew, at all. Um, and then Donna's watching. Hi, Donna. Uh, Teresa says, I design jewelry and do artwork. I mostly use colored pencils for my artwork. Oh, she's responding to somebody else asking a question. Um, so yeah, uh, so I'm gonna flip this around before I get too, too distracted. Um, before I, I switch over, I did wanna say thank you to everybody who got one of the little paintings either from the Bright Circle collection or from the Storyteller series that helped fund um, my class last week and made it possible. So without you all, I would not have been able to do it. So thank you so much for that. Um, you know, uh, we, maybe you don't know this, but um, you probably do if you're a regular viewer of or of our videos, but we kind of put all of our money and resources back into our businesses so that they can grow. Um, and so that oftentimes doesn't leave a lot of wiggle room to do extra stuff on top of that. So anything that I do, like if I take a class or do a workshop, it's either because I've sold some of my own artwork or because I won a scholarship or grant. Um, and if I, you know, I feel like it's a good thing when uh, my artwork enables me and empowers me to take more classes and learn more things. So I think that's a good thing. And I like that feeling, but I could not do that without all of you out there. So thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, and yeah. All right. So I'm going to flip this around and I'm going to do the paintings first because some of the stuff that I did not, uh, some of the stuff from the class is super dirty. Um, and I don't want to get the pieces super dirty, right? So let me flip this around. All right. 
right, here we go. Bonnie says, thank you for offering them to us. Have are fun to have an Andrew in my collection. Oh, good. Susan's watching. Hey, Susan. Shakita's watching. Hey there. It's been a while. It's good to see you folks. Now, some of these you may have seen in earlier incarnations. I honestly can't remember what I've shown and what I've not shown. Um, but I know these ones are not on the website yet. And some of these I'm going to add more to um, and clean some stuff up. So just keep that in mind. Um, here's this one. And it's kind of like one of those little dreamy dragon creatures flying. Um, I want to, I didn't, uh, I, I did this one and then I was like, I don't want, I don't want to do anything more to it. I like it the way it is. So I'm probably not going to do too, too much more to this, this one. These will all be available in the Allegory Gallery online store at some point. Um, I don't know if it's going to be tonight or not. I know that they wanted to do some filming and I don't know if they're going to be doing filming at the cottage or not, so I don't know how long that's going to take. Um, if you didn't see the video from last week, um, on Saturday, they ended up having to refilm it, so I don't know if they're doing that tonight or not. Um, so this is like a Kelpie. I'm probably going to do a little bit more, um, so there's a little bit more of a contrast um, cause there is kind of melting into each other. Um, so I'm going to do that. Um, here's this one, a little running box. And I really love these shapes. And, um, one of the cool things about doing these is that I'm probably going to translate some of this into my metal work, um, in my enamel work. So if you haven't seen it in my enamel work, I worked with a wonderful artist last summer named Tanya Crane, and she showed me her Scraffito and um, Limage um, uh, processes. And so I made a whole series based on using those techniques. And then this past Saturday, I was lucky enough to take a workshop uh, virtually with Misu Kerr, um, who is one of the chairs down at ECU. And she is a very, very talented enamelist. And um, yeah, so it was really nice to see her process um, because she specializes in that kind of painterly Limoges technique. Um, so um, I, I want to make some more while the iron is still kind of hot and the information still fresh in my brain and do that. Um, Bonnie says, I love the box. Thanks. Um, and Marion says a Kelpie. Yeah, the other one was a Kelpie. And then this one, this cat is kind of hanging out on its little pillow. I might add another pillow or two um, to make it a little bit more festive. And then this one, I did not know if I was going to be able to salvage this one or not. I made this unicorn and I love the cutout and I love the shape. But then when I glued it down, it looked a mess. So I darkened the background and now I'm a smitten kitten with it. Um, and so I think, I don't know, I kind of want to take it into a little bit of a darker. Um, I don't know, maybe I'll put some flowers, but I'll put some skulls in the flowers underneath. We'll see. Um, traditionally, unicorns are symbols of innocence and purity. Um, but there was a wonderful, wonderful little um, collection of short stories called Unicor Unicorns versus Zombies. And um, some of the unicorns are are not like gentle, friendly creatures. They're kind of kind of like war machine ponies. Um, and so I kind of like that. I don't know. We'll see how it goes. Um, Barbara says, I want the cat. I'm an... I, have an orange baby I've been holding out. 
I have another cat coming, but we'll I'll show you. I like painting orange cats. Gilbert's probably very pleased with that because I paint a lot of orange cats. Um, I, I don't know why I, um, but I do. I paint a lot of orange cats. In front of me is like another one. Um, so this is kind of a peacock. Um, I don't know why I ended up doing all this fancy cutout work in there. Um, because you can't even see that it was cut out after I've layered all the paint on top. But, um, yeah. Um, and here's an octopus. I think I'm going to add to this one and add some kind of things from the ocean floor and maybe some rocks and different things like that to it. Um, but we'll see. Um, I kind of liked it plain because I thought all the focus should be on the octopus, but it kind of looks almost too plain, and I don't know. So we'll see. Sometimes it's one of those decisions. So this one is pretty much finished. Um, I'm happy with this one. It's a phoenix rising. Um, sometimes you end up burning the forest when uh, you embrace your new path kind of thing. And, you know, that happens. And then I have this little um, froggy toad creature. And it's got a little floral crown. Um, this one's finished for sure. This one's finished for sure. Um, and this one's almost finished. I'm going to add a little bit of a darker shadow underneath to make it pop a little bit more. But those ones are the mostly done ones that are almost, almost finished. Like a, maybe a couple more washes um, or, you know, a couple more things here and there. Now, these next ones are more, I have to add more layers to this. Um, I had originally, I had these kind of arabesques put down and then I took them off, but I might add them back. Um, and yeah, so um, so yeah, so there's this one, and this one is a bat, and I think I'm gonna add a little moon and maybe some stars, but I did want to keep some of them more on the stark spectrum because some of them I've been noodling around with a lot, um, and I kind of want to have some that are that kind of embrace that quality of a, a more immediate silhouette as opposed to one that I've kind of worked and overworked. Because I have a tendency that if something's in front of me, I'll keep working away on it. And um, that's not always conducive. So I'm going to um, try to embrace a, some form of minimalism and... Um, and, and try it. I don't know if I'm going to be successful or not. Um, so the, here's a bird girl. I might kind of clean up some of these uh, edges so that it makes it pop a little bit more. But again, I've been noodling around on the face and I don't know about that. So we'll see. And then I have this kind of um, melusine or uh, um, uh, Naji. Naji, is that the name? I don't, Naga, Naga. Um, so the little snake woman. And um, yeah, so I, and I like this one also being a little bit more stark in that like the red is contrast to the green. So it kind of makes it pop. So I don't want to add too much of the like blending or shadowing because I don't want it to kind of like do any kind of weird fading in or fading out. So um, so I kind of like that uh, contrast of red and green. So we'll see. Um, William loves this one, but I don't know what I'm going to add to this one. I kind of, um, you know, when I was growing up, we had, um, we didn't have a lot of money and we lived in this old orange grove house which was this wooden house built in the 20s. And it probably was not built as a permanent, like a permanent structure, but um, 
at least not one that was going to be like last forever kind of business. Um, but anyway, so it had a crawl space underneath the house and possums would go underneath there. And if you've ever had a possum hiss at you, it's not necessarily a comforting feeling. Um, so um, I've never, I've never been like smitten kitten with them. But then lately, um, William's been watching these videos on Instagram of different possums, and they kind of look like Paolo a little bit um, with their gray and white and pink, pink nose. And they're super cute sometimes. So um, I kind of made that. So we'll see where this goes. Um, I don't really know um, if I'm going to add anything to it or not, but I might, I might not. I might kind of pick up the floral motif in the background and add on to it that way um, and brighten some of the pinks. But I didn't want to obscure the fur because I kind of like the way that turned out. Um, and then another little phoenix. I'm going to have to brighten up the beak here to make it pop a little bit more because sometimes when I darken the certain areas it will recess um, so I'm going to add a couple highlights to make it pop forward but um, yeah and then here's another little orange cat with wings and then someone's like is that supposed to be like an angel cat is it dead and I just think it would be so cool if cats could have wings also. But then they would probably, like, run and hide from me and I wouldn't be able to catch them. So I don't know. Maybe I would have to have wings, too, so that I could keep up with them. Um, but I always like the idea and the symbolism of wings being a sign of uh, freedom and kind of um, not being held back, that you can you know, fly up as high as you can fly kind of thing. So, yes. Harry says, we have two possums in our yard and they are friendly. Oh, good. And then here is a bear. And I kind of had this idea of making a bear with these rainbow wings. So, I don't know what I'm going to do. I might... Um, I, I don't know. That's the thing is sometimes the ideas, like I like it, but also I think that I went a little bit hog wild with the white, um, adding kind of like that. Um, I don't know what the right word is. Like it's not effervescent, phosphorescence. Maybe that's the right word. Anyway, it's glowing and, and I like it, but I don't like it. So we'll see. It's one of those things where we'll see. Um, I think for me, sometimes it's a weird thing where I have to sit with things for a while and then and then it comes to me. So after my classes, when I could do it, because sometimes my joints would hurt. So that's one of those things where I, I don't know if the blacksmithing is going to be something that I, like I know that I need to, so I'm selling these so that I can take more classes and also so that I can get some equipment. And um, after I took Elizabeth Brim's class, I realized that I really need to get some equipment because if I don't practice on a, consi on a consistent basis, um, it kind of is like starting from square one um, when I take these classes. So I'm usually in my classes, I'll be able to take like one or two blacksmithing classes every summer and by the time it rolls around the next time, I'm pretty rusty. So it's it's, it's nice to be able to um, to be able to do the things I want to do, um, and have that be accessible to me so that I can continue practicing and honing these skills. Because I also feel like um, one of the reasons why I'm taking these classes is so that I'm not so dependent on what other people kind of have for their designs, for their tools. I mean, there's a lot of really wonderful tool makers out there and, who are very talented and very 
thoughtful about how they make their tools, but I kind of want to make my own, you know. In traditional uh, apprenticeships, you would um, make your tools and then you would go on to work with fine metals um, and, you know, like progress your way up. So since I'm uh, before the pandemic, I was mostly self-taught um, and or I learned from books or sometimes we'd have people come to the shop and teach little mini um, weekend workshops. But for the most part, I didn't really have a very formal, like step-by-step -step education. And so I don't, like I didn't get a chance to like make my own tools or go through a thing where I spent eight weeks learning how to do this or do that. Um, and so I'm right now, I'm in the process of kind of designing my own program where I can um, learn different skills and techniques and then make them my own. So that's kind of where I'm at. Um, Cause somebody was like, why are you showing or doing an early career talk when you've been making jewelry for over 20 years? And that's kind of where I'm at is, um, before before the pandemic, I focused mostly on the DIY sector um, of jewelry making. I did mostly tutorials and um, wrote and edited for magazines on how to make your own jewelry and a lot of beading um, and stuff like that. But I didn't really do a lot with art jewelry and I did not do a lot with... Um, with metal smithing and you would think i would because my my sister's company is all about metal smithing but i didn't really do any metal smithing i did it like a cut i kind of helped them out a couple times and i was like this is hot this is dirty i don't want to do this so i focus more on other stuff and so kind of this taking classes is all about kind of refining these skills and honing them and kind of leveling me up into what I'm going to be doing next. And, and what I'm doing next is kind of revisits and connects to what I did before. And so it will empower me to make my own tools and do things like that, make armatures so that if I want to do a great big sculpture, I can do a great big sculpture and not have to worry about if it's going to um, hold up or not. Um, I want it like with my Cornelius sculpture, part of one of the reasons why it's so that I could do it is I already kind of had a, um, I had these displays from one of the old shop owners that were um, uh, welded steel and I could build my armature on top of that welded steel. Um, and it was kind of like a thing to display clothes and stuff. And so I was able to build on top of that and I, I didn't have to worry if it was going to fall over or get, you know, if the weight was going to hold up. Um, and so that's one of the things I would like to do is be able to make armatures that can support a larger scale sculpture. Or if I want to make a table with angle iron, um, I can make a table out of angle iron. You know, it's one of those things where a lot of these skills are, are, they're not necessarily hard. You just have to have the know-how to do it. Um, and once you know how to do it, then you can whip stuff up real quick um, and for minimal cost. And then it's not a, a problem. But sometimes if you don't know, you don't know, right? So, yes. Um, Lorraine says, I love these. Oh, good. Marianne says, Aura. That wasn't the word I was thinking, but that could also work. Um, it's a, it's like a bioluminescence. It's one of those things I, I can't remember the, the word. Um, Marianne also said, it used to be the apprenticeships were seven years. Yeah, so I'm on my own self-directed year what is this? So I started taking classes in 2021. So I'm on my second year of, of jewelry, of metal smithing and blacksmithing. 
uh, Binance is so expensive to take classes. I try to learn on the internet, but I can see a need for a person to person instructors in my future too. Yeah. So for me, I, I love to learn from books and I love to learn now from the internet. There's so many wonderful resources on the internet. The issue is that you don't always have the ability to like, especially when you're doing stuff that's more mechanically oriented. I really want to take a workshop with Tom Muir at Touchstone later this summer. Um, and I applied for a, a scholarship, an educational endowment scholarship so that I can take the class. So we'll, fingers crossed, I get it, but I don't know. Um, but anyway, so um, there are things that are like hinges and closures where you have to feel it. Because I've tried to make stuff on my own and um, that were were things that were very like mechanical. And for me, I'm not necessarily a mechanical person. I'm not somebody who has that kind of like engineering kind of mindset. Like some people they're like, oh, I could do the, do, 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 do. and then you could do this. Um, not necessarily if it's like, um, you know, there are certain people who have that technical streak in the way that they think. And I'm not necessarily normally one of those people. So for me, I think it will be very hel helpful to have an in-person class so that I can get used to the weight and feel of how different mechanisms come together. And there are certain things that you can watch on, you know, on the internet, but unless you have somebody there with you, it, it can be dangerous. Like there are certain chemicals that you should not be mixing. Um, you know, in a home environment without some kind of guidance. So I don't know. It's just one of those things where as I progress more and start to learn more, I definitely am getting to the point where um, I need those those ex those educational experiences so that I can be more familiar and then kind of take that information and self-direct that way. I don't know if that makes sense or not. Marianne says, I might need that Kelpie. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Um, Harry says, I was an apprentice goldsmith for eight years. See, I would love to do that if I could find a place that would let me do that. I don't know if I, if I could... Like if I could do it where I like committed one day a week or something or two days a week, um, then that would be more doable. There was a blacksmithing uh, program that they were trying to do at the local community college and it was gonna be run through um, the Center for Mel Arts. And I was super interested, but I guess they didn't get enough students the first time to make it run. So I was like, well, and that I could maybe do, but if it's like all day, every day, I can't do that. I can take off a, a week here, a week there and work at nights and try to answer emails on lunch breaks and different things like that. But I, I just can't, um, uh, with everything going on, I, I can't take off for, for years at a time even if I would like to. I mean, th there is a thing, um, they have uh, concentrations at Penland, which are eight weeks long, which is basically two months long um, or a whole season. And I would love to do that because then you get a deep dive into whatever you're doing and you don't have to worry about what, what are you gonna make for dinner and all this other stuff because there's somebody who makes dinner for you and, and, and your meals and stuff and you know you, they clean your your rooms and different things like that so it's one of those things where that would be wonderful but that is even uh hard to imagine doing that so we'll see you never know how the ball will bounce maybe i'll win the lotto and then and then i'll take all the classes um Marion says, and at least five days a week, Carrie. Um, Harry says, yes, it was full time every day. Yeah, that'd be super cool, but I don't know. 
if I could do that. But I would love to. I, I am I'm very smitten with this idea of like the master passing on information to the apprentice and that kind of work the way that that happens. But I just don't know if that's in my cards. <laughs> I think I'm allergic to being on camera because every time I turn um, the camera on, I start sneezing. Of course, my windows are open and people have been mowing their lawns all day. So there's probably a good and healthy amount of pollen in the air. So I'm going to go through and show some of the stuff that I've made in the blacksmithing classes. Um, and I waited to show this because um, until after I did the showed the artwork, because this stuff is dirty. Yeah. I'm going to have to do. All right. So when you take blacksmithing classes, one of the first things you do is you learn how to make a hook. So uh, part of making a hook, see, it's getting on me, y'all. Uh, a part of making a hook is then being able to taper your um, metal and drawing it out and creating a point. Um, one of the things that you have to be mindful of is, um, and also in the these classes, um, you're not just learning about a specific skill and only that skill. It's kind of like rubbing your tummy and patting your head at the same time because you also have to maintain the fire and learning how to control the coal fire so that it behaves in a way that you want it to behave. Um, because not all fires are created equally. Sometimes you can create a fire that is oxidizing, which builds up a ton of fire scale. And then sometimes you have ones that are not oxidizing and don't build up and you can get to forge welding temperatures, which I'll go into in a little bit. Um, Bonnie says, is that iron? It's mild steel. All right. So I made a lot of hooks. Um, and then some of them are more successful than others. Like this one is, I was working this hook a little bit too much. And I worked it too cold. And so it started splitting at the tip there. So you can see, you can kind of see, I can see it. You can probably see it if you were in person. But it's splitting at the tip. So that's not good. That's not good at all. And also um, learning the cutoff tool. So there's basically this wedge that's sharpened and then you get the metal super hot and then you place it on there and then you strike it and then you strike it on there and then you kind of go around and it looks like I chewed up the end of this, but um, I didn't, but I did kind of. And then there are things like this, which is like a scroll work. So you, a uh, part of this is learning how to flare out the metal and have it taper outwards you, how you can control your hammer blows so that you can kind of create those papers. Um, so this is a more dramatic look where I took stock like this, which was thicker, and then flared it out like this kind of paddly ginkgo leaf shape, and then also thinned it out here and then use the cutoff. So there, I have a lot of like random pieces that I don't know what I'm going to do with it. Um, and then also I made this kind of bud shape. And this is kind of how the start of how you make a, um, a spoon. Um, and what you do is you kind of taper it at the tip and then you draw out a neck after you've shouldered it where so you have your anvils like this and then you knock it on two sides and it creates a divot and then you can pull that out and stretch it. Um, and then you wanna keep a bulk here and then you push it out and make it stretch out depending on you, how you hit it. Um, I think I burnt up my metal here and there is a thing called a cold shunt. 
Um, so that's why I kind of cut it off and abandoned it. Um, and then I made a lot of these kind of spear-like leaf shapes. So this is um, like this. So I drew it out and made that point and then stretched it out this way and this way using hammer blows. You know, you, you have a cross bean hammer and then so you and then you if you want it to be more curved out, then you and then you flip it around and and then I tried to make a neck here or what they call a gusset. And that's where you put it on the anvil and you knock it. And it creates this kind of like a little diamond shape here. And that is, in theory, supposed to keep this joint um, stronger. I don't know if that actually does that or not, but um, in theory, that's what that's supposed to do. Um, and more hooks. This is out of a thicker, um, thicker stock. Now, that's another thing is once you get kind of comfortable working the thinner stock, uh, it is, then it becomes another challenge to work with a thicker stock. So it's, it's every time there are little kind of lessons embedded within the lessons. So if you work with brown stock, then to work with square stock. And um, if you work with three eighths inch, then to work with half inch or one inch and move up or to work with sheet. Um, and control your fire, make sure that you have the right kind of fire and that you're using the right hammer blows. Um, on a jewelry scale, you can do all these things. It's just so much smaller that you don't always see the different things. And also the metal works differently. Um, so let me see. And, um, so in theory, this is what like a finished hook will look like. And you tape around and, and in theory, I'm going to drill a hole and I can have like a coat hook, I guess. Um, and also to do this technique without, it's all done with a hammer. So this isn't like twisting and turning with like, um, sometimes they have these things called fire tweezers. And they're basically pliers uh, that are that you can use on hot metal, um, and you can do all those twisty turns. But um, yeah, so this is all done with a hammer and an anvil. So there's no no twisty turns on this one. Um, Bonnie says you could hang your necklaces on. Um, yes and no. Um, if you have anything that is beaded and stuff, if you hang it on a one point like this, then what's going to end up happening is you're going to create a weak spot over time. So that's just a, a good storage tip um, for any of the jewelry things. Like if you do it for temporary, then it's not a big deal. Or if you do something where it's like a solid piece of something, then it's not an issue. But if it's on a thing, like it's on a, a flexible beading wire, or if it's knotted or something, you can create a weak spot wherever it hangs right there. So that's just one thing to consider. Um, generally speaking, you want it to be on the, like either to be laid flat or to have something that replicates um, the curvature of a neck so that you don't end up with any weak spots because... Um, I've seen that happen where people will hang stuff up on a hook and invariably it's where it's hung on the hook that it breaks. So just keep that in mind. So then after we did that, we made a bunch of hooks and we made a bigger spiral. Okay. And so um, this is a tighter spiral. And so we made this so that it could be used as a texture. Um, I did not know that we were making this to be used as a texture. So when I cut this off, I cut this off super short. And then um, these were used to create um, textures in um, underneath the power hammer. And obviously this is, it would be not a good idea to put your fingers right up against 
uh, the power hammer because then you won't have any fingers left. Um, and I guess you could hold it with tongs, but it's hard to manipulate holding a piece of hot sheet metal with one set of tongs and holding this with another set of tongs. So I made a different version of this and I put it on a longer, this was on a much longer bar stock. Um, but when, when I was done using this as a texture, I cut it off. And then one of the cool things we did is we did this process called cherry red, which is basically case hardening. So it's a powder. And I'm guessing that it's like a super finely ground steel, um, like a high hardened steel and a flux. And you put it on and it just like creates a skin on top. Because this is held up, and I've run it through the power hammer. And I don't know. Oh, here it is. So here's a texture sheet. So part of Stephen Yusko's process is that he creates his own kind of found textures. So what he'll do is he'll take um, all different kinds of found objects and then put them under the power hammer and then um, create textures and then put other pieces of metal on top of those textures and then put that under the power hammer and then taking that and then using those. It's kind of like what we do with a gel press where we're making our backgrounds and we're making our, our color sheets and our textures um, and then kind of reassembling them in a collage sort of way. And so that's kind of what we did. So I had, I'm holding this with, uh, this is, imagine this, it's almost like glowing yellow so that you can move it. And then I had that in the tongs and then I had this and you can see where it kind of fits in. Um, and I just move this around and let the big hammer smash it into there. So I'm going to use this eventually. And what I think I'm going to do is I'm not going to work. Um, I don't have a forge right now. So I'm going to take copper and run it through um, and uh, anneal it really good. And then um, do the hydraulic press on this and kind of get this kind of um, this circular spirally um, texture and then have that part be part of it. And then this was cleaned with a wire brush, a wheel brush to get it, to get some, knock some of that fire scale off. So fire scale, if you don't know what that is, it's where um, the, the steel kind of creates an oxidation. Um, and it's like these little, I guess it's like a skin almost, um, where if you don't, um, uh, remove it as you're working, it will, the, will embed itself and create a texture, which is kind of cool. But at the same time, if you want something to be really clean and smooth and not have that texture, then it's not awesome. So um, then after we did this, we did... Um, this little exercise of working in different planes. I didn't really do a good job. I ended up smashing this and then abandoning it. Um, but you build a taper and then you flip it on the side and then you do another taper. And it's supposed to teach you how to control holding other things on an alternative uh, plane. But I ended up splitting it. You can see that. Um, and that's probably from me burning the metal. Um, that also is really not fun and kind of frustrating. And then I tried it again, but then I got the plane wrong. So instead of having it be uh, on the perpendicular, it's almost on the same plane. So there's a slight twist, but anyways. So I just chopped it off and, and kept it for fun. And then... We also practice forge welding, which I'm not good at at all, y'all. Um, I'm just going to be honest with you. I I can see how it's such a cool thing, but I need to practice with that because 
Um, I could not get it to stick a lot of times. It just wouldn't, like I would get it to stick, but it kind of wouldn't stick. And then so, like this is not forge welded because I can see through it. But it's where you get this super, super hot and then you smoosh it into each other and you use flux. Um, and I eventually got it, but I did not do a beautiful forge weld. Like this is forge weld on the top, but like at the bottom, you can tell it's not, it's not forge welded. So anyways, I can't imagine somebody was doing this all day, every day and make these chain links like this. Um, and I guess if you were really good at it, then it would be fine. But like I try to do it and I just couldn't get in the groove of it. This is another example of a forge weld. Uh, I didn't really know what I was going to do with this at, afterwards. So I just made a, a taper at the end. So if I need to like poke something, I guess I can poke something with it. Um, but yeah, so I did that forge welding and we made a spoon. This was done in Elizabeth Brim's class. And this is supposed to be so you can scoop the flux out. Um, we made really long spoons so we don't have to get our hands near the fire. And then under the power hammer, there is a, like a tapering exercise, which I was not really great at. Um, but it is what it is. I mean, so you work with this where you do, you work in this bar stock and then you break it down into doing it into a, a square. And then from that square, then you taper it down and you... You flatten the, the corners of that square, and then you have, uh, I guess, octagon. And then in theory, you do it again, and then it gets to be almost round stock again. So this was an exercise that I did not do so well at. Um, but again, you're only up there for a minute or so. You're not really up there for very long. So it's not like you have a ton of time to, like, learn to master it in the first few minutes of doing it. So this was about how to draw it out using the fuller die or the drawing die. And this I kind of liked. Um, and it was like pulling this out. Because normally if you had to do this, you'd have to hammer, 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 hammer. And it's not impossible, but it's way easier under the power hammer. So that I was kind of learning how to taper things. Obviously, I need to practice because this is kind of like in a diamond shape, not necessarily a square, which is what you would want it to be. And then here's another example of me trying to forge weld and doing a crappy job at it. But it got there. But yeah. And Marion said, which is why apprenticeships were so long. Yeah, so a lot of these things, you only have like a couple seconds, like a minute or two to practice. So if I could do that like all day, then maybe I would be get more proficient at it by the end of the day. But when you have such a short amount of time and you're sharing the class space, you really don't, you know, you have a cumulative of maybe 10 minutes under the power hammer a day. And um, it seems like a lot when you're doing it because um, it's hot and heavy and all this other stuff. But ultimately, you have very little time that you actually are working on stuff So underneath the power hammer. So I just need to practice with it to become more proficient. But this is another example of that texture sheet. This is done with rebar. This is kind of making a step kind of a gradation roof pattern type thing. This is to have the bar just kind of higgledy-piggledy. And then I burnt up my metal there. You can kind of see that. That's not ideal. Um, and then I kind of wanted to play around with that texture of the fire scale, which is this kind of stippling on all these surfaces. And so these themselves are not necessarily um 
for me, it's good to experiment, but like, I'm not going to like weld something onto this and then turn it into a paddle or something, you know? So it's one of those things where it's good to have experimented, but ultimately this was an exercise, not so much um, me making something. Um, and then, so then I took, oops, and I had this great big thick bar stock that was thick but flat, and I made this kind of cook, and my idea is, is that I'm going to drill this out in a couple different places and put uh, a rivet in another color metal, probably bronze, and have this kind of fun pokey thing i don't know what to use this for actually maybe if i had it where it's not if i could like stab it into something and then it could like hold it but i didn't really design this this was another one of those things where i had this hook as an exercise to learn how to uh cut the shoulder in and taper that out um but then once I did it, I was like, what am I gonna use this for? So then I just drew this out and made it a point on it so that at least I had a pointy stick. I guess I have like a little hook. So then by the end of um, the next to the last day, I made this. And I know it kind of looks just like a railroad spike. Um, but it's a steak and i made a bowl but i must have left the bowl at the studio so this is the beloved um because i've been wanting to do some japanese raising um but uh when when i took a class with glenn gardner he said basically the only way that you can get at the end of the class he said the only way that you can get these is if somebody dies or if um, you make them yourself. And so I definitely don't have the equipment to be making these myself. So um, so I thought while he sh um, Stephen showed us how to upset the end, end of bar stock and use that for what he would use it for would be like a chair or a table leg. So I took that same idea and then kind of tilted it on the axa, um, tilted it a little bit and made a steak. And I, I am going to use this and I have used this already to create a bowl. And if you go to my Andrew Thornton artist Instagram page, you can see a reel of me making that bowl. And in the video, it was a, a time-lapse video and maybe it's like less than a minute, but re in reality, it was over four hours of work um, to make that little bowl. And granted, I did not have it set up in the right way. And also it was after a long day of working um, in front of a forge. So I was not necessarily at my freshest. And the other thing is, is that, um, is that, I, I kind of had to do it again to remind myself of how to do it. So, and I kind of messed up a couple times and had to start not completely over, but I had to fix a lot of those mistakes. Um, and so, yeah, so I made that bowl with, or a vessel using the steak. So I'm very pleased with that. And then the last day, it was kind of the, we had some time in the morning to do whatever we wanted. So that's when I polished that up and ground it down. And then I wanted to make another steak, one of the big steaks. And so um, I upset the end of this and then drew this out. And I wanted to have that gooseneck so that I could do larger things. Um, and I didn't have a chance to clean it up yet. Um, the other night I went to the Allegheny's Metal Collective meeting and I saw Glenn there and I showed him and I was like, what do you think? And so he said that basically this is too long where I made it. So I need to shorten this and I don't want to shorten it because I spent so much time and effort. Man, oh man, I was like banging this against the 
a floor anvil, basically a block of steel on the ground. And I act like I was mad at it and somebody had stole my money and I was knocking it into 10 ways to Sunday. And yeah, so I don't necessarily want to completely cut it off, but he said to make this work the best would be to have this part shorter. So what I think we're going to do is, I don't know, I think maybe cut it and I don't want to think about having to cut it, but um, maybe cut it and then um, upsetting that um, and then maybe saving this and drawing out a taper so that I can keep it um, so it's not a whole morning of wasted work. But basically you put this into the stump and then you can create your bowl on top of this. But basically I made a long short stake. So this is the short stake. Instead of it being like one long stake, it became a long short stake. So I get what he was saying. Like if I try to manipulate it on top of this, it's just going to keep clinking against this. And it's not, I'm not going to be able to turn it all the way around. But if I had the, um, the upset, which means kind of flaring out and building mass in the end of it, if I had the upset part, here then i can it, since i have that 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 goose neck then i can have more um i can go deeper inside and create a more rounded vessel as opposed to just ones that um once you hit it uh, once it hits the end of it that's as deep as you can go. So um i don't know well, i'm gonna take this to the conference at touchstone and if we're allowed to work on it in the evenings, I'm going to try to get him to show me how to, to salvage this so it's not completely wasted. Um, it is super dang heavy. So that was another challenge is trying to work with this, work with multiple thicknesses. So I had these two different size tongs trying to hold this up. Um, and then I'm not physically very strong. So it was real interesting trying to bend this and shape this and do all this other kind of stuff, um, holding it on tongs, because this gets even more heavy when, when you add it on to the end of a couple feet of tongs. So, and then I also try to do this thing, which is going to be the holder for the vessel that fits into this, but I didn't get very far with that. And as you can see why I waited to the end to show you the blacksmithing stuff as opposed to in earlier, it's because I didn't want to get um, charcoal and soot and all that on top of the paintings. So, yeah. Um, Bonnie says, I think you could roast marshmallows on some of those. Yeah, maybe. Probably use a stick would be better because some of that I think you would get um, a little bit extra flavor or something and then you may not like it. Um, so I'm pretty happy. I learned a lot. Um, I didn't like master anything. I mean, I got pretty good at making tapers and I actually like making tapers. So that was pretty good. Um and I might clean this up and make it into like a little mini baby steak that's just a rounded so that I could do like the bottoms of, of a vessel, like a flat bottom so it's not like rounded. So I might clean this up and so it doesn't go to just be sitting here. Like they're like, what am I gonna do with that? Uh, is just to look at it basically at this point about how I didn't do a very good job at forge welding. And like things like this, I don't know. I mean, that's good to have, but it's not necessarily something that I'm going to directly use. So it's just a, one of those things where I'm just gonna have to think about it and see what happens. Um, I know not everything has to have a purpose. Like I, you don't have to make a, everything be a functional item. Um, I do like the idea of being able to to use these things since I've made them 
but I also understand and appreciate um, the learning aspect of it. Um, like this one, I can probably finish up this end and turn it into a usable hook. And this one, the forge weld's not awesome, but I could do something on this end and make it kind of usable. This one, again, I might do something on the end here so that I can use it as a stake. These hooks, um, I can maybe grind down where I messed up. Um, and use those somehow. But yeah, so I learned a lot. I learned how to work with the steel better, um, but I do need to practice more. That's a thing. And it's only going to come with time, right? So Harry says, stick it in a flower pot. Or, and Bonnie says, a garden stick. Yeah, I guess um, I could maybe weld it on some of the hooks on and have something to hang a flower basket or something. Um, there's a that's the thing I also appreciate is that there's a lot that you can do once you have that knowledge and know how. Then you can take those things like making a hook. And then you can adapt it to the things that you need. Oh, and I also made a sinusoidal steak. That's at the at the cottage. And I made some more texture sheets. Those are also at the cottage. Um, and those ones I can use directly in my jewelry making. So I also found a, um, it's called a pipe vise. And basically um, it has an opening like this that closes and it can hold round. Usually it's so you can hold pipes so that you can cut them and drill them. But I'm going to use that to hold the stake. And um, then I can like use that to form um, um, anti-clastic. Um, is it anti-clastic or synclastic? I always get those confused. Um, I think it's anti-clastic. But I am going to use that so that I can make some jewelry things. And I'll show, I'm sure I'll show people on Instagram um, what I use. But basically, it's a, it's a piece of metal that has different curves in it. And I'll use those curves. I'll take the flat sheet and hammer those into those curves. And then you can create kind of, um, undulations into the metal. So basically making Pringle chip shapes, if that makes sense. So it's a compound curve where you're curving up, but also curving down. There's a wonderful book if you are interested in that. It's, um, it's by um, Hecky Seppa. And, um, and he is probably one of the pioneers of that. But there's also a book um, that's called Creative Metal Forming, and it's by Cynthia Eid and he uh, Helen Longy. And that also talks about making those um, anti-clastic and synclastic forms um, using stakes and, and all different things like that. So there are things that I can then use in my jewelry work. Um, and so I guess, you know, there's little things like this, like if I put this in a vise, I can use that kind of impression, that depression in there and use that also um, if I wanted to. So I'm not gonna flip the camera around because my hands are filthy. Um, and I guess they're not that as filthy as they were this week, but they're pretty dirty. And the le the less I can touch my phone when they're like this, the better. Um, but anyways, I just wanted to say thank you all so much for allowing me to take this class. It's been a really wonderful experience. I learned a lot. Um, I wish it could have been longer, done even more with it. Um, I finally got to the point where I felt were confident and empowered in what I was doing, and then the class was over, um, which is normal. 
But it will also be good to take a break because my hands, man, I don't know about y'all, but they were, were killing me by the end of it. Um, so I need to, um, I'm working on fundraising to take some more classes. Um, there's one up in Massachusetts that I really want to take. Um, it's at Metalworks. There's a guy named Tim Laz Lazor, and he's going to show how to make um, chasing and repose tools. So work with steel again, but then use those tools to do some chasing and repose. And I've done some chasing and repose. If you watch the video from maybe last summer, I showed a little demo on how to do that. But it would be really wonderful to work with somebody because a lot of the chasing and repose was stuff that I kind of learned not necessarily, well, it was mostly on my own. So it would be nice to have somebody who can kind of troubleshoot certain things. And if I have specific questions about how to how to do certain things, then I can have that. Um, but again, mostly it's just a practice. But for me, I kind of have this idea that I'm going to make these vessels and have them be all kind of more, have more undulations and textures and different things like that, and then build up layers of enamel on top or have pieces, jewelry pieces that have those different sculptural uh, elements. And then I can incorporate that with some of the enameling and so it's all kind of building, you know, it's like, I, I don't know what I don't know. And um, when I know it, then I can either implement it or not implement it into my own work. But in any case, it's good to keep your mind open and to be open to learning new things and, you know, just to keep going. So Bunny says, wait till you hit your 60s. My hands hurt all the time. Yeah, so I have a little bit of arthritis. So uh, it's probably also from doing repetitive motions a lot um, and like pressing things out over and over. So I am very careful with my hands. Um, it, the arthritis runs in my family. And so I don't want to have... Uh, problems. And so I try to be really good about taking care of my hands and my skin on my hands. Um, sometimes if you don't, then you can get kind of poisoned through that way. So, um, or you lose flexibility. I was trying to paint after I took my class and I have these little brushes and I could barely hold the brushes. It was so painful. So, um, so yeah, I needed to learn camera control um, and how to let the hammer do the work and not my hand do the work. So there's little things like that, which I have to practice with so that I can become more proficient so that it doesn't uh, wear down my body, you know? So it's all little things to consider. Uh, Susan says, it's great to learn new things. Glad you enjoyed it. Uh, Bonnie says, I have CBD salve for my hands. That usually works. I have some too. Our vet makes it and, and it works really good. Marion says, I have some problems with my right hand. Not really sure what it is. Yeah. So if you, um, I try to do um, flexibility stretches every day while I'm working. Um, if I'm doing something repetitive, I try to take breaks and, you know, do that. I don't want to, because I have a, my hands full of fire scale, but stretching them out like that. So that you can keep your mobility and flexibility in your hands and in your shoulders. There's so many people who do stuff incorrectly and it um, it can take a toll on your body and really, um, you know, harm you. So always be, be as safe as possible. All right. Well, I'm going to get back to work. Hopefully you all have a great rest of your week. William will be back tomorrow. Um, I don't really know what he's showing tomorrow. 
Maybe he'll show some finished stuff that I made. Maybe I'll pop in. You never know what we're going to do. Sometimes I like to sneak things in. Um, but it's going to be a busy, busy time in the studio coming soon. So lots of projects, lots of activities and getting ready for that presentation. So that's been um, a, a big thing on my mind and getting everything ready for that. So um, if you are in Pennsylvania and we're in the area and want to come see that, I think registration is closed. But if you email the snag people and say that you missed the registration, they may be able to squeeze you in. I don't know if that's possible or not. Um, but I'm going to be doing my presentation for that weekend is the 19th, the 20th, and 20, 21st. And I'm going to try to make some new work to sell for that. So depending on how well that goes, I may have a, a bumper crop of stuff coming afterwards. So keep your eyes peeled for that. So you may see some of those little creatures and beasties um rendered in metal and maybe enamel or something i don't know i still have to think about it all right have a great night